Welcome first-time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. What about f***ing Colin? Why does he not have a f***ing job? Because he's still being white balls. Why is Tom not speaking out about that? He should be his biggest f***ing ally. And he hasn't said one f***ing thing. A lot of people that have come on this show, I don't know why, they've gotten some good f***ing jobs afterwards. Jim Rome in the jungle. It's right here in the sports deli, baby. We got some good ass karma right here. Let's fucking go. I love <laughs> oh, man. it. I love it. We hope you enjoy today's show, everyone. We're so honored on this 21st day of National Pomegranate Month to welcome Rabbi Harry Rosenberg. He grew up in New York and after traveling to Israel in his younger years, after living a life that was very different than he is living now, he realized that there was a greater calling for him. The founder of the Theological Research Institute, Rabbi Rosenberg, has studied the Torah with many, including former NBA star Amari Stoudemire, and has interpreted parts of it differently than some, and today you will hear the rest of the story. He and Amari taught the first ever online course on the Lost Tribes of Israel at the Harvard Israel Fair in 2018. He started building the iTribe, and we will hear more about that story shortly. He brews a delicious Ethiopian honey wine. He was awarded the New Voice and Vision for Peace Award. He's a farmer. He created a digital token. He discusses psychoactive plants that are mentioned in the Torah. Where was this when I was studying my Hof Torah for my bar mitzvah? That sure would have made things much more interesting. He's the founder of Trippy VC, and you can find him on Instagram at Rabbi Harry and on Twitter at Rabbi Harry R and on his website, rabbiharry.com. Uh, Rabbi, truly an honor. Uh, you know, um, we we want everyone to have seats at the table here in the sports deli. And typically I've talked about very similar issues when it comes to specifically women or specifically systemic racism and social injustice. And I haven't been apprehensive about bringing on someone from the Jewish community, but um, I'm truly humbled and honored because I think like you, when you will talk about what your greater calling was when you visited the Western Wall, you know, the the murder of George Floyd did something for me in particular. And I don't know, I've been asked before the direction of where this is supposed to go, and I don't know. But as an older white Jewish male, I feel like I need to be a bridge and an ally. And where that takes me, I have absolutely no idea. So again, welcome, truly humbled and honored. Um, you know, you've experienced a lot of um, different opinions recently, in particular, uh, as we'll talk about some of these issues. But um, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thanks. I didn't even, I forgot some of the things you've been saying about myself, so I appreciate reminding me. So, you know, I know when you were on a Tom Thomas's show, a civil rights activist, uh, an author, and uh, he recently just had Craig Hodges and Mahmoud Abdul Rauf on the show, who we hope to have on the show down the road after Stand, which is being directed by Jocelyn Rose Lyons, um, you know, uh, comes out in 2023 about the white balling of Mahmoud and Craig by the NBA who have still not had a public apology given to them by um, Adam Silver. But t- tell everyone first about your upbringing because I'm fascinated you know, by sports in New York, uh, just New York in general. I had a new affinity for New York after 9-11. You know, there's just a lot of things that I love about New York and, and it, it, its history. And so tell everyone a little bit about your upbringing and where you were and why you made a decision to uh, pivot. Yeah, I like the pun. Um, yeah, so I was born in Queens, Jamaica, New York, which I'm retroactively very grateful for because Queens is a melting pot. Um, I grew up in a you know, conservative reform Jewish house. So I went to public school, which allowed me to interact with that melting pot to grow up with friends from all types of places on the planet, uh, from India, from Africa, from China, and just seeing them as humans was, I think, very healthy for me. And then later on in my years, my family ended up starting to switch over towards more orthodox living and trying to put me into yeshiva. Um, so when I did end up going into yeshiva, I already was familiar with humans outside of this closed off insular community, which for the good, I, I believe it was they're closed off and insular. But so I always had that un, you know underlying 
uh, personality trait within me that I connected to people outside of the insular community because of my upbringing. Um, and then it was later on in life where I actually had, you know, going to yeshiva as a kid, it doesn't mean anything to you. Moses and the Bible right. and Torah, like, what do you even do with that? It's not video games and pizza and like hockey. That's, it just wasn't that. Um, but later on in life, when I had my own spiritual awakening, as you mentioned, where I had this calling, uh, part of that was understanding that there's a bigger picture going on than what it, what meets the eye, that the Jewish person is not the end all say all uh, remnant of the house of Israel. And there's people from all four corners of the world that we haven't even found yet, which are going to in the future wake up. And as I'm learning this information, I'm starting to see people waking up from around the world. So I took my childhood understanding of humanity and how we're all really equal and one you know, species of human and took that with some biblical prophecy and some of the teachings of my ancestors. And it gave birth to a whole mission, which I felt was fulfilling for me. It gave me purpose in life. I enjoy this mission and I hope it helps. I hope it helps the world. Yeah, I think it will. There's going to be pushback. It's, you said something interesting in passing early on because there was a either a duality or a dichotomy early on with me because I was at a Jewish day school. I was at Hillel and I felt not only because of my father's suicide when I was nine, I felt a lack of connectedness with the Jewish community. Uh, I had the traditions, like you said, some of the stuff doesn't mean anything to you when you're a kid. But in fifth grade, I went to a public school and there was something that lit up inside me that wasn't there when I was around my own people. And what you said was interesting because I felt the same way, like we were secluded. I guess the feeling I had was isolated in some ways and for good reason. We were protective. Uh, of our people because I was growing up not long after the Holocaust, as were you. So I got it, but but how I felt was this void or distance. Uh, but when I went into that melting pot that you talked about, I felt this like magic, especially around people of color. It was like, man, I wanted to learn every nuance, even to the point where back then people would say, why are you talking black? Right, which we wouldn't necessarily say that now, but you know, people didn't really know how to navigate certain spaces back then. But anyways, the point is that I just felt this connection um, for whatever reason, and it's always been something that's been very important to me. And so can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you had that and you articulated it and you lived it a little bit sooner than maybe I did in terms of being a bridge and an ally and taking this way deeper genealogically, biblically than I ever did. I did it through sports. Well, I kind of grew up in the same way. And I, you know, I, and I speak about this publicly and you have to give credit to the African-American community that when I grew up, I was wearing NBA jerseys to school every day, you know, Shaquille O'Neal, Anthony Hardaway. I had these jerseys, John Starks. And I was listening to rap music uh, growing up, you know, Notorious B.I.G. and Coolio and ODB, Run DMC guys. And, and you have to wonder how or why this culture became the standard norm for trying to be cool in the public school system in America. And it just, you know, became clear to me that there's a soul within them. There's a spark of creativity that is just so, uh, you know, life bringing. It brings life and creativity that you don't really see on any other people on the planet that come with this. And so it's beautiful. And the, the whole thing is, it has to be respected at the same time. Um, so the way I see it is if these people can influence the world with their sports jerseys and their rap songs, imagine how they could influence the world with their spiritual discourses and enlightenment that we're currently watching uh, unfolding, you know, this old spiritual awakening. So I'm like, I can give a Torah lecture all day. You know, maybe I'll have a few thousand views. A guy like Amari going to give a Torah lecture, he could have hundreds of millions of views, people downloading his spiritual reality. Um, so for me, I just, I'm living a life where I'm trying to magnify goodness as much as possible. And I see that these people are amplifiers. They can amplify good, you know, good things. So that's why I had no problem morally or ethically or any type of LY just going right in and saying, these people are trying to awaken spiritually. We have to be here to serve them and empower 
and allow and appreciate and give respect to and give thanks to it. Yeah, absolutely. And so you went back and you studied in Israel uh, after you went the first time. And so let me ask you this question. So when I had Steve Lavin on the show, former UCLA head coach, current head coach at the University of San Diego, and you know he basically said that John Wood and the Wizard of Westwood, former multinational champion at UCLA, that he was doing a deep dive into the correlation between religions at 99 years old. And I was like, you know, I'm not necessarily a religious person, but I found that fascinating. And that's that's interesting to me. And so I'm wondering, you know, because you can't force evolution, right? You can control what you can control. And then whatever dots get connected authentically and fact versus hypothetical or things that may not necessarily be provable. So what what do you say in terms of people trying to connect dots that may just see a tweet or they may have heard something from the past versus what you do, which is study multiple different um, spiritual backgrounds, histories of people in order to better understand the truth? Well, I think people are just generally uh, general under attack today yeah. to be able to download, perceive, become aware of what's really going on around them. Uh, between all the chemicals in our diet and the programming that's messing with our emotions and the ego and the lust and people chasing money, no one is acting on behalf of their soul anymore. They're acting on behalf of their ego and their fight or flight, which is just about self-survival. So people don't feel safe. I mean, if you don't feel safe, you're not going to think about anything outside of yourself. And so I was very fortunate. I found through, I found myself in a place of life where I felt very safe in my brain and I felt safe on this planet. I felt safe on this galactic journey that we're on and I surrendered. And once I started to do that, naturally thoughts started to come into my mind about the other because it was really, I was at peace, but I saw that there was more peace to be had. I didn't see myself getting to that more peace until everyone around me was at peace. So I said, you know, even selfishly for the greater good of my own peace, I need everyone around me to be at peace. And I'm a hedonist, you know, I'm a connoisseur of peace. I'm trying to find the most peace in the world. So that's why I said, how do we bring peace to the world? And then while I was thinking that, I was like, wait a minute, there's hundreds of millions of people from different nations and different religions saying they're part of the ancient nation of Israel, which is prophesied have a great unification at the end of times to cleanse the world and bring world peace. I was like, this is a no brainer. And then only after I had these thoughts, I found that I was descended from a great rabbi who spoke like this, you know, hundreds of years ago, who, who said these type of things. And I was like, wait a minute, this is some epigenetic stuff. This is in my genes to think and talk like this. So for me, that was enough, you know, uh, mixtures in the soup to get enough strength and wherewithal to say, I am going to dedicate my life to more than just enjoying myself but to trying to complete the mission my ancestors started. And for me, that gives me so much fulfillment, uh, spiritually, emotionally, physically. It gives me so much peace to know that I'm going to live and die on the mission of my ancestors. So I'm all in. And then I took advantage of my upbringing with multicultural people, lost tribes, and trying to play my role as best I can, humbly. So you said something that was interesting. You felt safe. And uh, I've heard more often on this show, not only about depression, about skin color, in particular, um, about being African American and in a black and brown community, that they still don't have basic needs, even though life is better in a lot of respects, they don't feel safe the way you do. And, you know, I think it's a good time to maybe interject uh, Kyrie a little bit here, because the, the, what I've posted about is that I don't feel like he knows exactly where he is in life in terms of his spirituality and he's lost he's a lost soul and i and i i equated it to someone who's adopted some people who are adopted they're fine with it they never seek to find out who their real parents are they don't have a void they're good and other people they are tortured they cannot live one second of one day without finding out why they were given up and who were their real parents? And first, again, I want to say I don't feel that Kyrie Irving is anti-Semitic, has one ounce of anti-Semitism in any of his bones. 
but 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 greater than that to your point about feeling safe i don't think that he feels safe i think he has a responsibility when he's in the public eye as you have shared recently in particular to be sure not careful but be sure that you qualify something like you would a rated r movie or uh, explicit lyrics in an old cd that you and i list, used to listen to so what do you what do you think about what i said about you know the the analogy with a kid who's adopted who's who's feels tortured every day to find out who he really is or she is yeah it, make, it makes sense and i don't even think it's a scenario of a kid it's probably you know um there was like i forgot the story of like a serial father or something but like hundreds and hundreds of kids across america who were like realized they were all part of one family so he's not just like a lone kid looking for who his parents are. He sees his whole entire community having that same sentiment and they're looking together and they have um, inklings of where it leads to and they're pursuing it. And then they see that people who seem to be enemies, enemies of them are holding that, those parents, you know, saying, oh, they're really my parents. And they say, what do you, it's, it's just one massive misunderstanding at the end of the day, but what you're right is, it starts from the innocent pursuit to find out what's true. And we shouldn't be in the business of silencing that. We have to be in the business of fact checking it. So instead of having silenced him for having posted this documentary, we could have just very clearly made an official response of where the documentary there's fabricated information. And um, you know that, that that's on the author's integrity and that there was some good information in the documentary, but Kyrie, uh, perhaps you want to make a public statement on the things that weren't factual about things you posted or not. You know, that's really a healthy conversation to have, but to silence someone looking for their roots is uh, not appropriate. But at the same time, you look at the news today, you see outside the Brooklyn uh, Nets stadium, you have, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of these people marching saying that the Jews aren't the real Jews. I don't think these people represent Kyrie. It represents the... African American, you know, and I didn't say this to anyone before, and I, I plan on making a post about it. But since all these podcasts and this stuff is coming out with Kyrie, and um, you know, some of the things I've been saying for the last ten years are becoming a little more relevant now. I'm starting to get, you know, hundreds or messages a day, thousands a week uh, into my inboxes from African Americans exclusively, and I just want to say on the record, not one of them has been negative or filled with hate. Uh, these are messages filled with love and strength and support and gratitude for speaking out and trying to connect. And I'm like, I thought maybe I would have X percent of these messages be filled with some negative rhetoric, you know, uh, rhetoric, and uh, absolutely not. And so I was like, the hate is actually from coming from our own people. The hate's coming from within, also from these people marching and stuff today. You know, I was able to personally trace back their leadership into what organizations that were really rapidly went out of the African-American community into greater political agendas. So the people who are marching today saying the real Jews are, are us and not them, they're actually peddling political narratives that have nothing to do with biblical prophecy or true spiritual leadership. And I'm seeing them very quickly. They don't represent the majority of the African-American school of spiritual thought. They're a minority. It's just the media making them seem like the majority to cause fear because feeling unsafe is actually the ideal state of uh, the type of government we're in right now over its people. So uh, we're, like I said, it's one big misunderstanding we're being messed with and we can find some clarity through this great unity that we see is, uh, at the table right in front of us. I want to talk a little bit more about Kyrie for those people that are interested in that part of this, but I, I think for the people that may be tuning in to listen to what your feeling is about uh, the true history of not only darker complected people that walked in the early years that you have acknowledged that were a part of the early history, uh, but anything else that people might be misconstruing or not truly understand, including myself, what you feel is the real history and what some of the pushback is from even some in the, of the elders in the Jewish community. Well, two things. First of all, I think it's so silly when people try to focus on what the original color of the Israelites are, because anytime someone asks me a question, the real way intellectual conversation works is, don't just ask me a question. Tell me 
what you're trying to prove with this question. So like what relevance, like when you ask me a question, I need to know what relevance is this question to what you're trying to prove in life. And they never connect the dots there. So like, so if the original Israelites were dark skin color, so now what is every dark skinned human on the planet a descendant of the Israelites? So what do you prove? How does that make you part of the story? Even if they were, you know, that doesn't connect the dots really. So it became an irrelevant point to me. It only became relevant when someone explained to me, what about, you know, the Jesus, you know, the the church tried to make us believe in a white Jesus. And if Jesus really wasn't white, they shouldn't put their white Eurocentric God on us. I said, you know what, that could or can't be true, but that has nothing to do with the Jewish people and, and, and what's going on. The history of the Jewish people, whoever start, you know, started off with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which were taught by the Jewish people themselves, weren't white-skinned individuals. They weren't pitch black individuals. They were boxwood, like a Yemenite color skin individual. Um, but the people of Israel very quickly left becoming a purebred genetic family um, mixed in with different nations over different periods of time for thousands of years, starting from Moses marrying a Midianite priest, the daughter of a Midianite priest, and Joseph marrying the daughter of an Egyptian um, royalty, and so on and so forth for thousands of years. The Jewish people is not a religion of DNA even though there are Kohanim priests and Levites within us that we have lines of DNA, but that's not the Jewish people. The Jewish people is a people of a reality, of a truth. The truth of the Torah is what binds us. So whether I'm a direct descendant of King David, which my family traces to, or if I'm the direct descendant of a Roman convert, you know, uh, 2000 years ago, which they were, it would actually have zero ramification or, or difference on my status as being in the house of Israel it's even considered a sin in the Torah to point someone out as a convert and to remind them that they're from converts or to refer to them as something other than a pure Israelite because they're a convert. Um, that would be, so it's like, it seems like some of these uh, religious leaders, like the Hebrew City Negroes guys that Kyrie posted, are acting as like spiritual bullies where they're making their own law that they're pulling out of the Torah without a school of thought that taught it to them. They say, I'm, I'm like the prophet. I looked into this English translation from the church and I pulled out this reality that you're other and you're worth. And I said, listen, this kind of mentality was taught to you by the church. This is trauma. And you're putting that trauma on us. And it's not the way it's going to work. And I even think you're being manipulated by a higher agenda for divide and conquer. So it's just a big misunderstanding. But it, it, it's not a good look for someone to, to take the 2000 year Jewish history and transmission of the Torah and cast it aside like it never happened, or to come up with a theory of how it's all from one convert. None of their theories add up. It's all speculative. It's not grounded in anything real. And so it's just not a good look to doubt that. You know, you can, I'm happy to have theological conversations, but so far no one's provided anything of substance besides just peddling homegrown religious ideologies that are causing divide between people that are talking about the same narrative and the same prophecy in the same land. Yeah. And I- to your point, I think what's troubling about it or concerning is that, like the group outside the Barclay Center in New Jersey who are protesting and they have political agendas or the far right, uh, and what we're referring to is Hebrews to Negroes, uh, and the author was Ronald Dalton and certain things. And for those of you that haven't seen it, I haven't seen the whole thing. I started to watch it. It's three and a half hours. It's very long. But you know, the Holocaust was not acknowledged you know, in this documentary. And so that's one of the things that is troubling to a lot of people, not just Jews, that Kyrie should have done his homework a little bit more before publicly speaking on something, even if he was searching fundamentally for where he came from. And so that's the concerning part, I think. That's the concerning part. And um, I have to have these conversations and, you know, even the fact just for me that the Hebrews and Negroes documentary acknowledges that real Hebrews were in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. I was like, wait a minute, you can't, those are literally like a chunk of the Jewish people with the Jewish Torah, part of this 2000 year history that you've just claimed and erased every document they've written down and produced in the history they had of those regions and just said, that's all was whitewashed or fabricated. It's just way too much mumbo jumbo that adds up to nothing because the the jews of the iberian peninsula were there for two thousand years producing writings for you know the last 1200 years that we have a, a hold of there was no mention of an exclusive color or anything it was just this is the torah of moses these are the laws you know converts are welcome they're not 
the Israelite exiles in Germany, it's in Iraq, it's in Morocco, it's in North Africa, it went to places we don't know. About. These were the things we wrote down. So you can't just take um, the identity of our people, of not my white people, not genetic people, of the people of the book, of, of the Torah. You can't take that and make your own narrative. And then uh, have people with blue checks and massive following start to promote it and getting them in trouble. You know, a Kyrie should go back to the Hebrews and Negroes guys and like call them out and be like, did you guys fact check your whole thing? Did you run it by an academic, you know, anywhere? And, and uh, that didn't happen. And, you know, and I have to be very careful, you know, as, as a rabbi, whatever. Let's say I want to post a video. And in the middle of the video is a very inappropriate scene with a woman who's wearing an appropriate. I can't post that as a rabbi. Like, it's, it's just something you can't do. There's when you wear a certain title, or you wear a certain name, or you have a certain thing, there's things you just can't do. But I'm not judging Kyrie. I think he could be a, a spiritual leader. He could he could lead many people to, towards their better selves and towards enlightenment and awakening. So I'm rooting for him to find his truth in a way that doesn't trigger others with untruths. And can't people make mistakes for crying out loud? Like, give me a break. Like, I understand the responsibility that comes along with it. But if you actually get to know Kyrie and hear people like Coach K who support him still – despite his mistakes and you look at the, his foundation and you look at who he's helped, you know, he, he donates constantly to things behind the scenes that nobody knows about. And I'm not justifying any of the mistakes, but I mean, give, give not only people of color, but give someone who's seeking a higher truth, some grace. Like it's so hypocritical yeah. and so arrogant. I think so. I think it's a twofold thing. One is obviously people can make mistakes People do make mistakes. People will make, make mistakes. We can teach in Hebrew, Sheva Yipol Tzadik. The most righteous man falls seven times. There's no righteous man who doesn't fall, doesn't mess up. Um, so we have to we have to always allow room for that. But at the same time, the way trauma works is if a dog bites a kid when he's a little boy, and now let's say he's 14 or 20 years old and a dog barks, he's going to shake or get very startled because his trauma kicks in from this four-year-old dog bite that he had. So because of the amount of times in Jewish history that talking about us in a negative way has led to us being raped and killed, we also have a trigger finger that's very like, right. keep my name off your tongue. Like, don't talk about us. And you're like, oh, chill. Like, why can't I make a mistake in this? And that? Like, you can, but just keep in mind our sensitivity of all the rape that we experienced for 2000 years. And we want uh, to be respected in that regard. You know, we want to have a would Jews are scholarly people. If you want to challenge our smartest rabbi or our smartest sage to a public debate on this matter, yeah, we've done that with the Rambam and, you know, Nachmanides. We've done this uh, for thousands of years with our sages. We've debated in an educational format. We could do that for sure. But having said that, um, the Anti-Defamation League, you said on Atan Thomas's podcast that they're not ready for the conversation. And so can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Because uh, I want you to give it context um, you know, because you call them, I believe it was a bully, uh, in some respects right, and they so, have done, they have done some good things, but, uh, obviously I was so happy you did that because I was a little uncomfortable with how they just took that out there because right. in that conversation with, uh, with Mr. Thomas, I was also very clear on the need for us to actually have organizations that we pool our money towards to defend us in the public light. And, and I was talking about them acting like a bully, not as an organization, in this very unique, specific topic, they're acting that way. And they're, I don't think they're the ones qualified to be in this specific conversation, but I don't want that to take away the light from the ATL and I think the goodness that they've done for the Jewish people. Right. Um, and I, res I have gratitude for them. I have, I'm all there. But I need to. think it should, you think the newly formed uh, league should be called the Pro Redemption League? You think that would be more progressive, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, that, that was one of many names that we should have thrown out there. But I think that the fact that the AD, you know, even like today, you see Kanye West tweeted uh, Shalom, right? Right. His, one of his first tweets back was Shalom. And then I don't know if you saw the state of Israel responded back to him and said, please leave us out of this or something like we don't have anything. And I was like, we don't have anything to do with this. And I was like, wow, what an unqualified answer because you actually have a ton to do with this because these are people who are coming from the diaspora of the nation. You, government of Israel, are focusing investment and resources on now to awaken and bring back to Torah, the Igbo tribe of Africa. 
So the fact that the ADL in Israel, the government of Israel can notice the elephant in the room over here, that these people are the genetic descendants of the people that they're now fostering to return to Torah, shows me the ignorance on the level of leadership yep. that they can't properly right. play their role that they need to be playing right now to, to bring a light onto the nation. So let the ADL stay in existence, let them do their thing, they're amazing. When it comes to the unity between the descendants of the translator the slave trade and the Jewish people, they need like a debriefing, you know, when like the a cop does something, he's got to go to like training and stuff. These people they need to go to like redemption training, the people in the ADL. Um, I'd be happy to have that conversation with them, but I felt a strong uh, level of uncomfort that the posts made it seem like I was this guy who, but at the end of the day, you know, um, content is king and clickbaits and this, and I don't know how many thousands of people reached out to me because of that, who, who now I'm in contact with and I'm actually sharing information that's helpful for them. So it was an uncomfortable means to get uh, my voice out there in a manner where people th then could really find out what I think when they dive deeper into my works. Yeah, I appreciate that. We won't be chopping and cutting this up in any way, shape or form. It'll be put out there in, in its original form because I think people need to hear that and it's authentic and it's from the heart. And you're fundamentally about, like I said earlier, being a bridge and being an ally and, and finding the truth. And so I think that's powerful in and of itself. And let me ask you a question, something that I thought about. Um, you and Amari Stoudemire, former NBA star, have a very unique relationship, and it's it's pretty much strictly biblical uh, with with the Torah. You don't necessarily go for coffee and and have dinner all the time, but you have this connection with with the Torah and seeking a greater understanding about you know the history of of our people. And so if you had Amari and Kyrie and you at a table, what, what do you think would be the first thing that you guys would talk about uh, in that conversation where Kyrie is where maybe Amari is now and he's seeking to get to a higher place? First thing first, we just take out a world map and rewind to 2,700 years ago. Um, and we go forward from there. And... We navigate this map and show where the Northern Kingdom of Israel, where the Southern Kingdom was, where the exile of the Northern Kingdom went, and what years did that happen? And what years did the Southern Kingdom of Judah and Judea go into exile to Babylon? What years did they come back for the Second Temple? What year was the Mishnah written down, the law written down? Where was a thousand years of Yeshiva in Babylon happening? Where was the diaspora that Josephus spoke about going to Africa? Where were they at this time? You know, just start to fast forward through time and just paint this picture, show when the Jews got to the Iberian Peninsula, show, you know, within 50 years of each other, the transatlantic slave trade and the Inquisition happened where Jews are fleeing Spain and Africans are getting sold, coming from the same ancestral diaspora, just showing an overhead view of it, explaining the nuance between someone who kept the Torah and the Jewish law throughout the exile and an Israelite who didn't. What is the significance? What happens to both of them in the future, according to the prophecies? Then we'll go right into the Igbo tribe, their customs, their traditions, all the things they're doing from the laws of Moses right now, all the beautiful documentaries, the research, and then go into the translated slave trade, and then go right into now what? What do we do now to go forward? And, um, you know, Amare was a guy that once he fully understood the depth and the beauty of the Torah, he 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 drinks it like, like an athlete would drink Gatorade, you know, like playing sports. So, and, and I come from the school of thought where I'm a yeshiva student, where I, that's like a monk, you know, like you're in a dojo and you'll study Torah for 18 or 19 hours out of a 24 hour day for years on end in a meditative Torah trance or studying, you know, so I come from that school of thought where now I'm not even in yeshiva anymore, but my mind is trained to think like a yeshiva soldier. So you look at a guy like Amari, who never even had the luxury of spending seven years straight in yeshiva. He, had, he never had that opportunity, but his mind functions like a yeshiva student. So just to notice the spiritual purity that other people would have to work so hard on attaining that it comes so naturally to him. I was just like, this, this man needs to be all resources given to him to help him become a, a, a voice of empowerment for spiritual energy for the people out there. Like you said, who are looking for their father in quote unquote in heaven looking for their spiritual source 
Um, that's why I'm a super believer in Amari. And it had nothing to do for me with, you know, the fame and the celebrityism and going out to these dinners. And, you know, that was, that, that, that means nothing to anyone. What are you going to do with that? You're going to get a bunch of likes on Instagram. This was about how we could actually create a system of scaling light at, a, at the highest rate possible. And um, I put my chips on Amari. I thought he was the man for the job. Yeah, no. And you don't hear enough about it, to be honest with you. For, and we could speculate as to why that is, right? I think he's just getting started. He's, you didn't even see anything yet from this man. Um, I think there's going to be massive, massive booms of light coming out of him education-wise, platform-wise mission wise uniting communities he's i think he's still even in the cocoon didn't even burst out yet and that it's shocking because look how much we've seen already yeah that's amazing shout out to tamir goodman too, the jewish jordan for putting us in touch i should have mentioned that earlier but tamir's doing amazing things he's been on the show obviously he's an influencer in israel doing doing amazing things and i know you guys have a relationship so mad props to tamir um and what he continues to do let me ask you a question about uh, the Palestinian people, because, you know, everybody from Farron Kid to another, of uh, you know, many other groups of people, have you know, have opinions about it. And, you know, Atan asked you about it. And Atan just talked to Mahmoud and Craig about it. But you said some interesting things that I didn't know before about the land specifically. And it's not as simple as, well, we here in the United States will do anything, including going to war for oil. And it's not that necessarily black and white or Israeli Palestinian. So can you, for people that don't really truly understand from, you know, the late forties to what was offered to where we are now and why there's this disconnect and just, you know, briefly educate people and, and where you think we should go when it comes to this. Uh, situation about the Palestinian people? From my understanding is there was no history of a Palestinian people, first of all, that has to always be understood. Right, that's um, what I was saying that you talked about with the time that, you know, I didn't necessarily know that specifically. It seems offensive, but uh, it's just reality. The Palestinian people will tell you the same thing. They're Why not is that? Uh, well, because they come from different family clans from different areas across the Silk Road over the last 2,000 to 3,000 year period that had nothing to do with each other culturally, except that they both spoke language and at one point converted to Islam, uh, but, but keep their own dialects and customs within that. Um, so there was no Palestinian people, Palestinian leader, Palestinian doctrines, Palestinian flag. There was never a Palestinian reality. There was just various bands of tribes that lived across these regions. And so there's different categories of Palestinian. There's, I think 25 or 30% of them were people um, who were once Jewish, who were in the land and went through forced conversions to Islam. Um, there's another, let's say, you know, 20 or so percent were indigenous, um, Bedouin, people who were Arabic speaking 2,000 plus years in the land, never left perhaps. And then a great majority of them were opportunity seekers from Jordan, Egypt, Libya, Syria, uh, Lebanon, um, certain areas of North Africa, who came to Israel seeking um, opportunity with the advent of the European settlements and um, the church, you know, and Ottomans, and especially when Israel became a state. And then all of a sudden, when Israel in 1948 starts to have rec this recognition, even prior to that, all of a sudden, these nations all around them teamed up on Israel and tried to kill all the Jews. You know, right after the Holocaust, like we're coming to kill all you guys, Egyptians and Jordan, Jordanians, Syria, Lebanon, and the Jewish people won these wars. We didn't show up there and start any fights, really. Yeah, maybe there were some land grabs over olive trees and a few settlements in this, but we didn't systematically try to kill anyone. The Jewish people always try to live in peace with their neighbors for 2,000 years. It's not in our MO or in our cards to be violent or attack anyone. And all of a sudden, we win these wars. And the Palestinian refugee issue is formed, which was like the last stronghold these Arabic countries, speaking countries, had on why Israel shouldn't be, have the right to exist because of these people there. So no nation, this is the oldest refugee like, crisis in the world and the highest financed one possible. And these are a small relative fraction of humans that actually came from the lands that aren't letting them come back. So these Palestinians have Jordan, their whole family clans in Jordan or in Lebanon, they can't even return back to their family because their governments don't want to lose this asset they have called the Palestinian refugee. 
which is a milked reality to cause uh, anti-Israel hatred and the right for Israel not to exist because of these guys. That doesn't mean that Israel's not treating them poorly in a way that's not reflecting well in our Torah value and our ethics. So I'm not saying that they should live in ghettos and should have infrequent electricity and but also it does come also down to their leaders who take billions of dollars of donations and put it into war infrastructure and not on solar panels and greenhouses that will give people abundance and high quality of life. So it's a very tricky issue. The ones who are 25% of them who were once Jewish are actually making up a majority of the terrorist attacks. A lot of the stabbings are coming from the Palestinians that were once Jewish, which is like somewhat of a cry for help or social, you know, some type of psychological response that we could definitely speak about. Um, but for the most part of the Palestinian people, they're just looking for equal opportunity, jobs, freedoms. They like malls and driving around and, you right. know, they enjoy the whole thing. Um, so I would hope that a righteous government takes over Israel when they were, it really shows the nation how we treat our, our issue. You know, we're going to shower them potentially with love, you know, give them plants that'll help heal them naturally and electricity and clean water good quality of life, you know, a few water parks, whatever it is, let these people enjoy their time and space in their brains while they're under our, our being a host in our land. So you don't think necessarily they should have their own uh, area? I think it's clearly defined in the prophecies written thousands of years ago that in the end times, uh, people are, the nations of the world are going to come and try to divide Jerusalem in two, and that's going to trigger the creator of the universe to step back into the picture publicly and be like, you don't divide my land. Um, this is the place where I'm going to make myself known to the world. And it's not going to come through a, a religion that's going to need to use force or violence or threats to spread my name. It's going to come through light. And you don't have to coerce someone to see light when the light's on in the room. So God doesn't want to have to coerce humanity. And that's what religion's been for 2,000 years, is the coercion of humanity to believe one thing or the not. So I believe that there's going to be something that's going to happen different in the world where Jerusalem will be a place where people are going to understand what real spirituality is about without needing middlemen or, um, you know, access points through organizations to get to real spirituality. So I don't think dividing it into two is ever going to happen because it's just, I believe in the prophecies. Call me crazy. No problem. It's not going to trigger me. I could be crazy. It's not going to trigger me. This is just what I believe. Fair enough. Uh, okay, I'll leave the floor for you, but let me ask you a few rapid fire questions. We'll fun part of the show. And uh, if there's anything else you want to talk about, whether you know it's the lost tribes or anything that you've produced, you know that you want to talk about uh, that I think is important for other reasons. Uh, anything that you know you think that's important that we talk about as Jews, as allies, as bridges, as truth seekers. I'll leave the stage for you. So, uh, kafelta fish or latkes? I'm vegan, so I'd have to go for the vegan latke. <laughs> a vegan latke. I love. I thought you were vegan. I, I I think I read that somewhere. So, Amari Stoudemire or LeBron James? <laughs> Amari Stoudemire. <laughs> wow, man. Uh, so, who was your favorite Nick of all time? Um, I grew up liking Patrick Ewing and John Starks. Yeah, John Starks with the lean and dunk wow man well who who was your favorite uh, uh musical artist uh when you were growing up jerry garcia wow after everything we talked about today jerry garcia i enjoyed grateful dead yes wow man <laughs> that's incredible any particular song um i liked you know, the song called ripple i felt like it was very mystical and it always had me thinking wow that's incredible wait so the mets or the yankees I was a Yankee fan. <laughs> Wait, so you're a Giants fan then? Um, yeah, growing up, I would have been associated with Giants over Jets. Yeah. Did you ever, so wait, did you, you played ball when you were younger? Like, did you? I was a hockey player. Wow, really? Yeah. So wait, who's your favorite hockey player of all time? Uh, Yarmir Yager. Of course. So uh, you might be interested in this. I had uh, Mike Hartman, who won a Stanley Cup with the Rangers in 1994 on the show. Oh, that's epic. And, yeah, Jewish as well. So shout out to to Mike. He's doing some amazing things. So you so you never went to Ruck, Rucker Park to play? No. <laughs> so what, meditation or yoga? Um, I don't do either really, but I would do like oh. Wim Hof breathing if anything. Yeah, that's awesome. Wait, do you have but a favorite? I'm not fully vegetable? healed yet, so I want to do both. I'd want to get into yoga and meditation. Absolutely. So do you have a favorite vegetable? Uh, well, probably a cucumber. Wow, interesting. 
any any interesting dishes that you make with the cucumber or do you add cucumber to something that maybe somebody else wouldn't have thought of that makes the dish you know more tasteful yeah i put like hummus on a cucumber with some jellied onions is amazing wow jellied onions yeah Man. wow i've never heard of that that's incredible wait do you have a favorite fruit i'm probably gonna be a banana guy wow so i've been eating this i don't know if they have trader joe's there but they have this dark chocolate frozen banana dessert. Oh my God. It's like unbelievable. Oh um, God. So those of you I'll that are trading. Really trade oh my God. I didn't like dark chocolate for my entire life. And something last year just clicked. And I'm like, I'm such a dark chocolate fan now. Uh, so where do you see yourself in five years, Rabbi? Um, sitting under a tree somewhere in a state of ecstasy, enjoying the radiance of the divine presence because we've already been in the, the redemption of, had it unfolded and we've gone inside ourselves again after thousands of years. What do you think are the most two most important things that other communities and cultures could learn from what the Jewish community has done well in the last 50 years? Um, Jewish people practice unconditional love for each other, which in Hebrew is called arebut, guarantorship. So if like you want to buy a house, you need a guarantor to sign on the house in case you default on payments. So the Jewish people are obligated to be guarantors for each other in all regards. So I think that mentality is very healthy. And I think that we get together for prayer um, keeps us as a community. So just being there for each other and praying together is probably two amazing things that fostered um, our strength that we have today against uh, a world of people un not unified. What would be the third thing if you had to choose a third thing? I have kiddish. To always set times to bring a bottle and some crackers where guys can get together and girls get together and have like a bite to eat socially. It brings people together and eat food together. Well, that leads to my last question that we famously ask on the show. I'm going to ask you from two different perspectives. As a rabbi, if you could have five people at your dinner table, past or present, dead or alive, and I will not say uh, that you've never met them before. I'll, I'll allow somebody to come to your table that you've met. So past or present, dead or alive, what five people do you think would be the most impactful to change the world? Elon Musk and Kanye West would be two of them. Wow. And then I'd probably want to pull in like Moses and Adam. And um, any women? Uh, behind every great man is a greater woman. Well, I think I would go with Eve, the wife of Adam, because maybe Adam's going to come back and he's going to be so lonely. He's going to be like, where's my wife? Where's Eve? And I'm like, oh, don't worry, Adam. Eve's right here with you. And I think putting them together, we could solve a lot of the issues with uh, divorce rate and marital couples that can give us good marital advice, perhaps. Who would be the fifth the fifth guy? You know, I'd probably go for my great-great-grandfather, the Vilna Dawn, some rabbi from like the 1700s who was... Wow one of the last chains on the transmission of Torah. I think that would be enough because between Moses, Adam, and the Vilna Don, it would be enough spiritual information to debrief Kanye and uh, Elon Musk into what's really going on. And then them too, with their wealth and their platforms and strategy could probably help free humanity and liberate us from wars and oppression and stuff like that. What would be the first thing you'd say to Elon at the table? I would say it's a pleasure to meet you, Elon. I think we have a lot of good work to do together. What would be the second thing? I would give him a little spiel. I would want him to understand um, why I think there's uh, ammunition for decentralization. I would explain to him what's going on with the ancient Israelite diaspora, what's going on in Afghanistan with the Pashtun and Nigeria with the Igbo and these hundreds of millions of people from different regions who are looking now to um, join a, a unified coalition of sustainable technology and of freedom of thought and, and and i think there's power in numbers and um so i would explain to him that and i think you know he'd get a better understanding of like wait a minute we could overnight turn key create a system that will take away power from ruling governments that are causing wars in the world and and uh, not to lead to anarchy but just to have total transparency of of human governance on this planet would be um, i would task elon with this job yeah, I feel like he has a greater responsibility also. And yeah, I'm a little triggered by him also. This Nikolai Tesla was, uh, you know, I believe he created like free wireless electricity or something. He made technology that could free humanity. So it's like, why are you going to take Nikolai Tesla's name and make a product that's not free and scalable to people around the world? 
but perhaps Elon knows about it and he's like, let me just generate a few billion first and I'll roll it out. It's on my roadmap. Don't worry, Harry, I got this. And I'll be like, all right, sorry for doubting you, Elon. Or maybe he'll be like, oh, you know, I'm just hustling. Maybe I, maybe I messed up choosing Elon in this team, but I would have to at least uh, waste a, a person on him to find out, you know? But it's possible I would swap um, Elon Musk maybe with a, with a Joe Rogan because if you can get Joe on your team, then you go right to, he'll get you right to Elon. So it's just like Joe's, and Joe's probably one of the smarter people on the planet today. Um, so I'd want to, to uh, you know, but I don't know, maybe I'm just biased and I have a viewpoint that's uh, too, too masculine or too right or too left. I don't know. So, you know, if you have any feedback on what my choices say about me, then, you know. Yeah, well, that would definitely be an interesting conversation. And, you know, I don't know, it's multi-layered. I don't want to oversimplify it, you know, before I let you go and, and leave the floor for you before I ask you the last question, which is what five sports figures would be at your dinner table. But, you know, I don't understand why people are so afraid to uh, not only forward the conversation, but to be allies and bridges like you and I are, even if there's uh, some dissenting views so that we can have more middle ground and greater respect, even if we disagree. I, I just, I don't understand it fundamentally. I, I don't understand why we can't have strong opinions, but then respect what the other person is saying and articulately listen to what someone's, someone's concerns are, you know, what they're seeking, like you said, instead of just putting it out there without context and then letting the chips fall where they may after we control what we can and have these powerful people at the dinner table and just get to a, a higher vibrational place because that's what this world deserves. Yes, we do deserve it. And I think that this healthy communication you're trying to talk about, which would be the logical approach, leads to harmony and unity. And I think even you know from seeing the fallout of 1960s Woodstock and the hippie uh, movement, there is no real desire for a greater unity and peace from um, the ruling system as so right. it makes sense to me why we're trying to turn these things into conflict and not into resolution because the resolution is so clear right before us and the conflict is just creating chaos and our brains were designed to feel good and be at peace so we're just that's what we're, we're looking for and we're just being messed with i think so who are your five sports people at your table rabbi i i guess you're gonna want to have um Kyrie, right? Not many people would want Kyrie at their dinner table, but I would. Wait, would you rather have Kyrie or Kanye? Uh, Kanye, because Kanye can get to Kyrie, I think, easier than Kyrie to Kanye, but that's just me speculating what I know about uh, how social right. media and Twitter works. Yeah. I don't know if that really works. Um, I'd love to have um, the boxer. Muhammad Ali. No, the guy who's in, uh, I just forgot, he just came to Israel. So my name, the money team guy. Oh, <laughs> Floyd Money Mayweather. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Didn't expect that answer. Um, I'm just looking for people who have, who are still in their window of influence to take advantage of it while they can. Because in America, we treat influencers like gum, you know, we chew you up and then you're old and then we have to move on to someone new. Yeah. So I always think like while you have this window of influence, that's we need to use it you know um so not colin Kaepernick. Oh, um it would probably be interesting because he kind of was one of the first people who sparked this whole cancel culture mindset and uh i think he would love the whole in gathering reality and uh yeah probably he would be a candidate you know that was yeah. a good one um can we take people back from the death i'd love to sit with kobe bryant you know yeah for sure May his soul rest in peace. I don't know why I'm thinking like NBA. There's no one NHL or MLB coming to my brain that I'm thinking is like a world peace guy. Um, I'd be interested in Shaq being at the table. Shaq's almost as cool as I can get. I know he has some, he looks pretty good to me to ever talk with. Well, he's still relevant too. There we go. So according to my theory, it would make sense to have him at this table because he's got a powerful voice. So I guess, um, I guess we have one more or so. But I'm um, still thinking NBA and um, I had like a master shaman healing woman who knew all the 
plants and their medicinal values and how to make tinctures and heal people from the earth, I think she would be a crucial component to this uh, knowledge platform because we have to preserve the sacred wisdom of the plants. Interesting. Man, fascinating conversation, Rabbi. Anything else uh, that you feel like it's important that people understand about you, uh, your journey, and, and the bigger picture? Um, yeah, I treat life like a video game. You know, you have to try very hard to win, but you can't take it all personal if, you, if, if it doesn't go the way you want it to go. So just try your best, but don't get triggered by the outcome. Just enjoy the ride. Have fun while it's happening. You should know that according to spiritual teachings, you could play a role in the unfolding of the universe and be a partner with the creator if you make yourself available and hollowed out to fill yourself up with that spirit. And secondly, most of the time we're ever judging anyone or anything, it's most often we're only having those thoughts because there's something about ourselves we're judging. So be very careful about passing judgment on others. It's usually you're putting it on yourself and then you create bad karma loops for yourself, created the reality through your manifestation. So try your best to uh, see the good point in other people and to see the best in situations so the world will look at you that way and uh, stay humble and enjoy and feel free to reach out to me with any questions i genuinely appreciate it so wait what was your favorite video game well, i actually used to play professional counter-strike it was like a shooting game wow. i was in tournaments. yeah i was in tournaments i came in first place in israel uh the travel tournament once and um and now i got my sons playing Fortnite and um <laughs> I think it's great. Most parents will disagree with me and um, I'm happy to play sometimes, you know, with them and bond with them. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I'm a, I'm a, I like video games because I think it's a cruel world. You know, it's like we've been in thousands of years of darkness. So just my main thing is that people should enjoy themselves. You have to have a good time. You have to enjoy your time and space in a way that doesn't take away from someone else's right to enjoy themselves. So video games is a very neutral thing. You know, I could go play basketball and wear my Nikes, but there's some kids in China who made these Nikes. But at the same time, there's kids in China who made these PlayStations that these kids are playing on. So I'm like, hey, we got some issues. We, <laughs> we got to figure this out. I want to enjoy my time and space without it being at the expense of others. Video games seem to be right. that way. But at the end of the day, I'm still a privileged, uh, you know, white male in America who has access to these things. And I'm at the top 1% of the world with this luxurious lifestyle of video games and enjoying your brain. Not everyone has the luxury to say what I'm saying. So I hope that these things that I've been speaking about for 10 years and our prophecies warned us about, about this decentralization where we could scale technology, people can have access to electricity, clean water, food systems, health and wellness. So we don't have to have uh, people impoverished to serve a greater and, and the, you know, that stuff's got to go. And we have to figure out while all that's happening, how we can all enjoy our brains throughout this process. So um, it's not my world. It's God's world. This is something that was created by a creator that I believe is wise. So I'm not going to take the whole thing too serious and too personal. If God, if the world's going to get fixed, let the creator be more involved than myself. But I'll try my best like a video game. Well, wise words from uh, Rabbi Rosenberg. I uh, can't thank you enough. Sure glad you visited Israel way back when. Uh, and that uh, you were granted a sign and you've gone down the path that you have because I would say that your body of work speaks for itself. And, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of amazing things. And I think even the best is yet to come. And thanks for joining us today. Happy Hanukkah. Much love to you and uh, continue doing amazing things, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Appreciate it again. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. And God bless you and your listeners. And I hope that your show will increase in the bringing light and clarity to humans on situations where it's needed. That's all I care about. Thanks, Rabbi. I appreciate it very much. Much love. God bless. All right, all right everybody. Rabbi Harry Rosenberg uh, joining us today here in the Sports Deli. Uh, can't thank him enough. A fascinating conversation. Um, and we want to make sure that we are doing as much as we can to mobilize in this space and your voice absolutely can make a difference you can as i've said before you can like a post you can share this podcast you can uh, stitch something you can duet something you can just comment on something There's a lot of things that you can do to help uh the collective vibration you know that we seek even if we differ on some things to come together for the greater good and so Rabbi understands that better than anyone coming from New York, you know, understanding what sport is all about. And now he's playing a much more important game in the game of life. So thanks again, everybody. Much love. 
happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, and happy Kwanzaa. And for those of you that don't celebrate any of those things, have a great and safe holiday season and much love. Till next time. Peace. Hey, everyone. If you stuck around this long and you want some more amazing content, here are today's outtakes. Rabbi. Hey, what's going on? Man, you got to be tired, Rabbi. Uh, no, it's okay. I'm just setting up my camera over here. Um, yeah, take your time. It. Oh, man. The honor's all mine. Okay, let's see what we got here. Here, let me just set up my camera stand. Are you on the farm? Um, No, just in my man cave. <laughs> Spoken like a true New Yorker. Um, appreciate that. Hold on. Okay, here we go. I love it. Shalom, Rabbi. Thank you for uh, being here. Now, of course, it's my utmost uh, honor and privilege. Uh, I'm going to do a formal intro, and you know, we'll we'll get right into it because it's uh, three o'clock my time, so it's ten hours difference. Yes. So, it's, so it's about what one in the morning there. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah. I'm used to being up on American hours because a lot of my work and conversations happen on American scheduling. Boy, that was phenomenal. Great job and much love to everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Stop the bullying. Stop the Asian hate. Contact your local and state politicians for any inequalities for any individual or any group that's being marginalized. Also, everyone, we want to raise awareness for those individuals that are currently imprisoned for nonviolent offenses in particular those with long-term sentences that are disproportionate in particular to those people in the black and brown community. And I want to send a shout out to 40tons.co. 40 Tons is a socially conscious cannabis brand and they're a social enterprise using the regulated cannabis industry to fight injustice in particular for cannabis prisoners. So check them out again at 40, the number four, the number zero, tons, plural, 40tons.co, because what they're doing in the cannabis space and being a socially conscious company is truly incredible, and uh, they have my full support. And also wanted to remind all of you, if you're having a tough time, you can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, and that number is 800-273-8255. That's 800-273-8255. And now you can call 988. That's it. All you got to do is dial 988 from any phone. And they are available 24-7, 365 days. And if you want to follow me on social media or... Check out other episodes of this amazing Sports Deli podcast or any of my other podcasts. Go to my link tree at linktree backslash Mike Hootner. And if you'd like to support us at the Sports Deli, we'd love to have you either make a one-time donation or feel free to make a donation monthly, either $0.99 cents a month, $4.99 a month, or $9.99 a month. If you have uh, questions about that, Send me an email again to thesportsdeli at gmail.com and I will send you the link on how you can do that. Uh, you can also find it at the bottom of every podcast on Spotify or uh, Apple Podcasts. A link at the bottom to support the show. Please check, check out it. our website at thesportsdelipodcast.com. Make sure that we continue the conversations with regards to three strikes and you're out and mandatory minimums, especially people that are in jail for nonviolent offenses. So those things need to change. And remember, gents and ladies, please remember to do your monthly self-breast examinations. And remember, guys, this afflicts about 1,500 men annually with about a third of those resulting in death. So we want to make sure that we do our monthly self-breast examinations, both men and women. And guys, remember to do your self-testicular examinations every month as well. Until next time, remember it takes a village. I'm Hootie Hoot. This has been a production of Hootie Hoot Productions. Thank you for joining us in the Sports Deli, where everyone deserves a seat at the table. Remember it takes a village. Much love, everybody.